the five of you who have joined us for the last uh, talk of the day. Um, and I really hope that you have enjoyed these opportunities to just take a little sort of bite-sized chocolate of our, um, our research activity. Um, my work uh, for the last few years has focused less on pure environmental law and more on the way in which law needs to respond to environmental change. Um, and I've focused in particular on climate change adaptation law as an emerging area. And in terms of uh, sort of pitching something that would be of broader interest to people who weren't just working in this area, I thought that the issue of sea level rise and some of the legal dimensions of that might be of particular interest. Um, you know, for those of you who might um, have shacks, uh, you know, the idea that your shack might turn into a houseboat is uh, particularly problematic. Um, many of you would have seen graphs like this before. The uh, latest uh, uh, working group report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, um, projections in relation to uh, sea level rise show very high levels of variation between now and 2100. Uh, but what's striking about all of those graphs? They're all going in the same general direction. We aren't seeing any of them where there's uncertainty that, that, that sea level might actually drop. I think that that's one of the important things to pick up on Jeff's point about dealing with these issues. Um, we can argue about uncertainty all we like, but really we're not talking about questions of if, but really questions of when in relation to sea level rise. Because one of the other very um, uh, distracting parts of the debate about the science of climate change is that we tend to put our graph ending at 2100. You may not be surprised to know that the sea level will continue to rise for thousands of years after that. Um, even once we have stabilised global temperatures, sea levels will continue to rise. And on the current trajectories, um, there's debate about how much the sea level will rise, um, but it's rising at faster than at any time uh, in recorded history at the moment. And it's looking like over the next couple of thousand years, we will be looking at a seven to eight metre sea level rise. So while we might only be talking about up to one metre by 2100, um, that's really just pitched for the purposes of political horizons. And we're talking about you know, profound challenges uh, into the next century. So what does it do? Well, it creates risks of flooding, risks of coastal erosion, and risks in the rise of the coastal water table. The rule of thumb in relation to flooding is that... I'm just, sorry, I'm just... Um, sorry, the risk... I'll just start with the risk of flooding. The rule of thumb in relation to flooding is that for every 10 <coughs> centimetre the sea level rises, you will treble the likelihood of inundation of a certain area. So if you live in an area that currently gets a one in a hundred, uh, sorry, a once a year king tide sea level rise, it's more likely to be three times a year. If you get a king tide or an extreme high tide inundation, there's a lot of parts of Australia that are getting these um, you know, three or four times a year at the moment. That would be once a month. Uh, that's for 10 centimetres of sea level rise. It goes up exponentially from there. So if you then get 20 centimetres, it won't become three times, <coughs> it won't become six times more frequent, it will become nine times more frequent. So the, the risks become exponentially greater. It's obviously not too much of an issue when we're only talking about recreational challenges. Um, I took this photo uh, in the, on the Gold Coast um, on a day when the Currumbin boardwalk was experiencing a king tide and everyone was having a great time except maybe the Chihuahua. I think he was just wishing that he'd taken swimming lessons. Um, so for a lot of people now these extreme events are more in the nature of a novelty 
But when that becomes a once every three day occurrence, um, it moves beyond uh, amusement and beyond inconvenience to having a pretty significant um, economic and socially disruptive impacts. In terms of the risks from coastal erosion, there's another rule of thumb, and this one is perhaps more disturbing for the Australian sandy coastline, and that is that for <coughs> sandy beaches, for every metre of sea level rise, and if you think back, that's the, the sort of the probable scenario now for 2100, for every metre of sea level rise, we're likely to see 50 to 100 metres of shoreline erosion. So shoreline recession. If you think about <coughs> beach houses that you have stayed in uh, or that you might own or the beaches that you particularly like to go to and what is 100 metres behind those beaches, that's what will be facing the sea by 2090, 2100. It may not be our problem, um, but it certainly will be our children's or our grandchildren's problem. And that's not a particularly long time frame to be creating those kinds of impacts, um, which really sort of uh, dovetails back to the points that Peter was talking about. Um, another photo, I've taken a series of these photos from the Gold Coast. This picture here is actually this house here, I took a photo back in January 2009 during a King Time event. Um, and I took this photo to show how crazy it was to allow new development in this <coughs> highly erosion prone area. And I was showing that this was where the high watermark was here. Little did I know that there would be an extreme storm uh, only five months later. And it, it completely took away the beach from that area. I just love this one because of the auction sign. <laughs> Who would ever buy that house now? Mm. Um, interestingly, in these photos, you don't actually see all the coastal protection work that the Gold Coast put in place um, after the cyclone in 1975. And it's only because of this rock wall that is always hidden by the pumps <coughs> onto those beaches that these coastal mansions are allowed to persist. Uh, whether or not that rock wall holds steady uh, over that 2100 time frame is a whole other matter with a multi-billion dollar um, uh, price tag attached to it. The other issue that I think attack, attracts a lot less consideration is this one about um, the rise of the coastal water table. We have so many services that are located underground. Um, in some cases it's underground power, but in any event it's sewerage and water supply for most of Australia's big coastal communities. Bearing in mind that 80% of Australia's population lives within 50 kilometres of the coast, it's the vast majority of our infrastructure um, and our uh, recreational and economic activity. And a huge amount of that is already experiencing problems because of routine inundation and sort of backwash uh, in, in many, many parts of the country. What can we do about some of these things? Well, apart from radical, um, rapid mitigation of greenhouse gas emissions as quickly as we possibly can, and I don't want to ever uh, suggest that adaptation is an alternative to mitigation, we can pursue a range of adaptation strategies of which law will play only a small part. There's obviously technological innovations, things like beach nourishment, and that's the one that's on the cards for Roaches Beach and um, the Lauderdale area that Clarence Council is working on fairly um, aggressively. There's hard coastal armouring uh, technologies, and these range from both the kinds of rock walls to groins, but also to these kinds of artificial reefs. Um, that are being used in some places to soften wave impact. Um, there are some parts of these kinds of technologies that can have a win-win outcome for both mitigation and adaptation. So increased planting of coastal mangroves will both um, preserve coastal habitats, um, protect the coastline, but also provide valuable carbon sinks. And so there's a, a very strong movement now to focus on those adaptation, mitigation um, partnerships that can achieve outcomes on both fronts.
Uh, in terms of where law comes in, uh, there are a range of man management <coughs> strategies that are being actively considered. Obviously, where we're considering citing new development, the first rule now should be, and in most cases is, don't put new development um, and new infrastructure in hazardous locations. That's the easy part, really, because where you don't have developed land, um, there aren't as many sunk costs. The investment might be in imposing restrictions and paying some compensation to the developer to respect those restrictions. But it's not really feasible to do that in the short term in relation to the Sydney coastline, um, big parts of South East Queensland and Victoria, where there are really, you know, as I said, billions and billions of dollars invested in coastal infrastructure. Over the long term, we might be needing to consider retreat options and uh, the way in which we implement those retreat strategies is part of the work that I look at. Uh, not only the legal tools, but also the trade-offs that need to be made in the way in which those things are done. Are we only talking about retreat strategies for human communities, or do we need to think about ways to enable coastal ecosystems to migrate inland as well? And if we only think about the human communities, are we essentially cutting off options for ecosystems to migrate? So those are some of the things that I'm particularly interested in. Um, but uh, in, in terms of broader community preparedness and resilience to some of these changes, there are also questions about um, management strategies that focus on early warning systems to encourage people just to get their furniture off low-lying parts of their house um, when we know that there are going to be flooding events, um, encouraging people to change the floor coverings of their houses so that they're not going to have carpet, they've got hard surfaces. If they're going to have six inundation events to get wet feet each year rather than um, the one every two or three years kind of events. So there are a range of different um, adaptation strategies. In terms of the regulatory and legal strategies, there's the, the dimensions that focus on planning and minimising impacts in respect of uh, new development, as I just mentioned. Then there's a whole range of legal mechanisms that we can consider that either will require people or encourage people to either retrofit their homes, modify their homes, and in some cases to facilitate that very, very controversial retreat kind of option. And then finally, it wouldn't be a talk about the law if we didn't raise issues of liability. Um, it, it comes up in a whole range of ways. If a local government has for many years protected a beach, has that lulled property owners into a belief that that protection will continue into the future, such that if they change their minds, they're going to be exposed to liability. If a local council builds a protective structure, and it isn't quite good enough, it hasn't quite done the job of withstanding that one in a hundred year storm, is there liability in that situation? If a local authority has approved development in a hazard prone area, that with best science it should have realised was going to be too exposed. Is there going to be liability in those circumstances? Leaving aside the liability questions, if we are going to encourage property owners or indeed require them <coughs> to relocate and retreat from these highly exposed areas, who is going to pay for that? Uh, the person who, who um, uh, has purchased in full knowledge of the, the highly uh, dangerous nature of coastal uh, properties um, or the community as a whole. And there's going to be a really significant debate, I think, over the next hundred years. Um, it's started now, but most councils have not been particularly brave in making big decisions. And if any of you read the Mercury and look at the way in which Clarence is really having to na navigate the current coastal threats of uh, erosion in particular at Roaches Beach um, and you know, the idea that they've had lots of studies done but they haven't been able to actually make the courageous decisions as Sir Humphrey Appleby would describe them, um, it really highlights the, uh, the tensions that we're going to see into the future. Tasmania's made a few um, 
steps forward in relation to setting planning benchmarks for new development and redevelopment of sites. Um, but at the moment I think we're still very much in the early stages of understanding what the scope of the problem is. Realistically in Tasmania we have far fewer concerns because of the size of the population, the value of the housing stock, you know, we don't have that many highly exposed mansions in Tasmania compared to uh, the mainland states. But uh, relative to the size of the economy and the population, there will still be challenges here and there's a long journey to uh, travel before we've got to the end of this one. And even when we've got to the end of it, um, our children are going to find a whole new journey ahead of them as that trajectory of sea level rise continues. So more anon. Thanks very much. Thank you.